This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. Sponsored by Amazon, Audible, HostGator, Gamefly, and supporters of independent media like you. Welcome to the Humanist Report. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is the 35th episode of the podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by our latest member on HumanistReport.com, Elsine Perez. And we've also gotten some donations from Gordon Bibby and Chen Chen. So thank you all so much for sponsoring the podcast. On today's episode, I will be talking about voter suppression in Arizona and how Bernie Sanders is actually suing the DNC officially. I'll also be talking about a story from Nico House, who claims that Bernie Sanders' campaign has been infiltrated by Hillary Clinton staffers and supporters who are trying to sabotage his campaign efforts. Also, I will speak with Alex Law, who's running for Congress to represent New Jersey's first district. And before I get to that, I have a update for you guys. So last week, I told you about a story about Tim Canova, who is challenging Debbie Do Anything for Hillary Wasserman Schultz, the DNC chair in Florida. And what did she do? She decided to rig the election and suspended his access to Van. Well, you guys stormed the DNC with your calls, you signed the petition, and also Tim Canova's campaign filed a lawsuit, and guess what happened? The decision was reversed. So once again, we took on the DNC and we won. The same thing happened to Bernie Sanders, the same thing happened to Alex Law, and the DNC is now learning that you can't mess with progressives. So I wanted to give you guys that tidbit of information because I thought it was great. But anyways, let's just jump right into the topics. I'll begin with voter suppression in Arizona first. So we all know that when turnout is low, Hillary Clinton tends to win big. Now, this was the case in Arizona. Turnout seemed pretty low. But this isn't because people didn't want to vote. They actually did. In fact, potentially hundreds of people, maybe even thousands, left or were turned away because of Arizona's voter suppression tactics. So there are multiple ways in which the state of Arizona has suppressed the vote. Now, Hillary Clinton won by about 18 points and her voters are silent on the issue, but this concerns all Democratic voters. Because if you think that this issue isn't gonna affect Hillary Clinton if she does become the nominee in November, Think again. So in 2012, Arizona had 300,000 voters participate with only 200 polling places to accommodate them. I'm going to repeat that. 300,000 voters, only 200 polling places. But now get this. So in 2016, the estimated turnout more than doubled, which is typically good for Bernie Sanders. So we would have expected him to win because the turnout in 2012 was 300,000. And this time it was estimated to be 800,000. So it actually nearly tripled. So you would expect that Bernie Sanders would perform much better than he did. But they cut the number of polling places down to 60. That means for every one polling place, there were about 13,000 people trying to vote. Now in some counties like Maricopa County, there was approximately one polling station per 21,000 people. I'm going to say that again because this is really crazy. One polling station for 21,000 people. People had to wait upwards of five hours to vote. Many of them left if you have a, a disability or you can't stand long or you just had to get back to work. Guess what happened? You had to leave. You couldn't stay there and vote. So I want to remind everyone, if you're not aware of this, we live in a democracy. This isn't supposed to be happening in a democratic regime. You should be able to vote easily so. But the fact that there was 21,000 people per polling station is ridiculous. These are the types of tactics that you see in authoritarian regimes where they don't want people to vote. Now get this, in areas where there were more Latino voters, there was only one polling station per district. And in some districts, there were none. So if your district was busy and you only had one polling station in these uh, densely populated areas with Latino voters, you could try to go to the next uh, district, but neighboring districts had zero. So in some cases, you didn't have a single polling station in your own district and you had to leave your district and go to the next district, which is already jam-packed. So according to US Uncut, Maricopa County recorder Helen Purcell was responsible for the reduction in polling places in 2016, justifying it by saying turnout was traditionally low, so the solution was to reduce the number of places where citizens could cast their vote. Now, when confronted with this, guess what she did? 
She literally blamed voters. I'm not joking. Check it out. Who's to blame for this, these long lines? Well, the voters for getting in line, maybe us for not having enough polling places, or as many as we usually have. But I think we've seen the, uh, the hype in the last, uh, I'd say, week to 10 days of the um, candidates, uh, the national candidates coming here, which we haven't seen in past years. So I think that's kind of stirred everything, everybody up, energized yeah. them. There's definitely high interest. Now, sh do you, do you, are you saying voters should have sent in ballots by mail because you're saying they're partly to blame for standing in line? Well, no, they're not to blame for standing in line. But they went to the polling places. Uh, they could have voted early or, you know, that was their option in this instance. Um, so I don't mean to blame the voters. Who's to blame for this, these long lines? Well, the voters for getting in line. Voters for getting in line. Now, there was also evidence of vote purging going on. So if you are trying to vote in an Arizona primary, you have to know that it's a closed primary state. So for some people who wanted to vote for, Demo uh, for Bernie Sanders, vote Democrat, who were mistakenly registered as independents, well, they were given these provisional ballots, and we all know that those people are more likely to vote for Bernie. So Kelly Thornton, he is an election day technician in Yavapai County. He said that he was given a script by the Yavapai County Recorder's Office to read to voters verbatim when they asked if their provisional ballots would be counted. The script outright tells the voter that if they cast a provisional ballot when the system lists them as independent, their vote will not be counted. Now, here's the image of that, and here's what it said. If an independent voter asks if their provisional vote will count, please tell them every provisional ballot is checked for eligibility. If you are not registered as independent, other party not designated or libertarian, you are not eligible for this election, and therefore, by law, your vote cannot be be counted. If you are registered as a Democrat, Green, or Republican, and your ballot is otherwise eligible, then your provisional ballot will be counted. Now, according to Heavy, many people who had voted Democrat in past elections reported that when they showed up to vote, their names were not on the list of registered Democratic voters. So let's backtrack a little bit. Votes were purged. If you were not registered correctly, and in some cases this wasn't to the fault of some people as they were switched, not because of their own doing, well, they tossed your vote. That's what happened. So we don't know how many votes were purged, but we all know that independent voters are overwhelmingly likely to support Bernie Sanders over Hillary Clinton, so we don't know how many votes he lost there. Now, in addition to this, we're going to take out our tinfoil hats for a moment because there are some other suspicious things that happened. So, uh, there were four suspicious evacuations of government buildings in four locations in Tucson. Uh, and these occurred during peak voting times. So this means that everything was put on hold for an hour. Uh, people who worked there couldn't answer phone calls of voters. Uh, everything was put on hold. So now, if there was a legitimate bomb threat, then I want them to evacuate the building. But given the fact that all these other shenanigans are occurring, we have to wonder, is this legitimate? Was this purposeful? Who knows? We don't have evidence for that, but I think that it's worthwhile to note that this was the case. Now, finally, at 8.30 p.m., about an hour after polls closed, guess what happened? The press had declared that Hillary Clinton was the winner, even though not even 1% of votes had come in. And even given the fact, get this, that there were hundreds of people lined up to vote in many districts still. So they were sitting there waiting in line, and they got the news that Hillary Clinton won with less than 1% coming in, and they didn't even vote yet. What the hell is going on, guys? This is absolutely maddening. How can you declare Hillary Clinton the winner when you don't even have all of the votes coming in yet, when you have people standing out in line? Now, we all know that it's the case that Hillary Clinton did end up winning, maybe because of these voter suppression tactics in Arizona. And if that's the case, then that's bullshit. And Hillary Clinton can be happy now, but again, it's going to come back to bite her in the ass in November against whatever Republican she runs against if she does become the Democratic nominee. But... The fact that news outlets would have the audacity to declare Hillary Clinton the winner when people are still voting and you don't know how they're going to vote, that's messed up. That's some bullshit right there. So now, here is Bernie Sanders' response to all of this madness. We got an email uh, last night from a woman uh, in Arizona who was waiting online for five hours to vote. For five hours to vote. Now, whether that... Uh, 
whatever the cause of that problem is, people in the United States of America should not have to wait five hours in order to vote. We do not know how many thousands of people who wanted to vote yesterday in Arizona did not vote. We don't know if they wanted to vote for Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, or whoever. We don't know that. But in the United States of America, democracy is the foundation of our way of life. People should not have to wait five hours to vote. Uh, and what happened yesterday in Arizona is a disgrace. I hope that every state in this country learns from that and learns how to uh, put together a proper uh, election where people can come in and vote in a timely manner and then go back to work. Now, here's what you need to do. We need an investigation. Sign the petition. Thankfully, it already garnered over 100,000 uh, votes or signatures, excuse me. So it will be the case that the White House is going to have to address this, but we still need to keep on piling it on because the more signatures it gets, the more uh, the more recognition and notoriety that it's going to get. So we don't need the Obama administration to take a sweet time. We don't want to delay. We need to sign, even though it's surpassed its threshold, to show him that we want a response now, that we want an investigation. This is absolutely insane. Not only did Arizona brazenly attempt to suppress the vote, but the individual responsible for this blamed voters. I feel like we are living in the twilight zone and this isn't reality because these people, they can't be this dumb. I mean, if you're going to suppress the vote and you're going to try to limit Latino communities from voting, you'd think they would at least be a little bit less open about it, but... They don't give a damn. They don't care about you. This is supposed to be a democracy, and this is happening right in front of our eyes. Let me tell you this. If you are in Arizona, you should be right in front of your county courthouse or county clerk's office protesting with a sign calling for an investigation because this is outright maddening. This is insane. And everyone across the country should be extremely frustrated with this because, again, even if you're a Hillary Clinton supporter, don't think this isn't going to hurt your candidate's efforts as well. Voter suppression overwhelmingly hurts the Democratic Party and their voting blocks. But even if it's the case that voter suppression harmed the Republican Party and their voters, we should still come out against it because this is wrong. We live in a democracy and it shouldn't be this difficult to vote. In December, the DNC suspended Bernie Sanders' access to Van because they claimed that one of his staffers had breached Hillary Clinton's voter data files. Now, this staffer, we later found out, was supplied to Bernie Sanders' campaign by the DNC. But nonetheless, time and again, this has been a go-to strategy for the DNC, and they're not really worried about whose voter file data are uh, breached and whatnot, because Bernie Sanders' campaign claims that their voter files was breached by the Hillary Clinton campaign, and nobody did anything about that then. And also, Hillary Clinton breached Obama's voter data files in 2008, one of her staffers did, and nothing was done about it. And furthermore, the DNC has cut off Tim Canova's access to Van in Florida and Alex Law's access to Van in New Jersey. So this is a go-to strategy for them to try to stifle the campaigns of progressive challengers to the establishment candidates that they love so much. So I've got an update for you guys on that story. It's official. Bernie Sanders is suing the DNC. So The Hill explains that the Sanders campaign served the Democratic National Committee with its lawsuit over access to party voter files. It said Thursday in a court filing. U.S. District Judge Tanya Chutkin had given the campaign a Thursday deadline to serve the DNC with the suit or risk having it dropped from the federal court. In the new filing, the campaign said the two sides continue to engage in cooperative discussions in their efforts to resolve the pending litigation and will keep the court updated on those discussions. Now, the Sanders campaign said we are dealing with the DNC on an issue where we felt that they did not deal straight with us from the beginning. So the reason to keep this in place was to make sure Senator Sanders is treated fairly in this process, the source told The Hill. This filing is very procedural. We went through with it because the report is not yet Yet complete. DNC spokesperson Mark Postenbach echoed that optimism in a brief statement to The Hill. We continue to have productive discussions with the Sanders campaign and look forward to resolving this matter, he said. Okay, so to basically break this down, uh, yes, Bernie Sanders is officially suing the campaign, but he may not actually follow through with it if he can somehow settle or resolve this with the DNC themselves, uh, because he, he just has to file the suit 
otherwise it's going to be dropped. And he doesn't really want to drop it yet because he knows that the DNC is going to resort to these same dirty uh, tricks once it's dropped. So he's just doing this to keep it open, but he doesn't necessarily have the intentions of following through with the suit fully. And uh, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have to criticize Bernie Sanders for a minute. Buddy, love your campaign. I'm going to vote for you, but you're being too nice here. This is broader than your campaign. Um, this isn't just about you. This is about the Democratic establishment using this dirty trick against other progressives as well. Again, as I've stated, you're not the only one who they cut off access to Van of. So to let them go sets a precedent and tells the party and basically gives them permission to continue to resort to these dirty tricks. And guess what? We're not going to do a damn thing about it. So have that at DNC. Continue to violate the rules, your own rules that you set up. Continue to treat progressives like dirt and then expect us to vote for you come November. It's a despicable strategy and they need to be sued entirely to be taught a lesson. So please, Bernie Sanders, do not settle. Follow through with the suit. Sue them so that way they don't do this again and that way they're actually scared because if there's anything that they're scared of, it's a lawsuit. Maybe not because they're worried about the cost, but because this is going to generate a ton of press that could potentially harm the Democratic Party and whoever their nominee is come November. So as soon as Tim Canova threatened a lawsuit, guess what happened? They restored his access as well. So we have to make sure that we keep the pressure on them. Now, by buckling, now I'm not going to say that he's going to buckle, but by saying that you, you would potentially settle this outside of court, it's frustrating. They have to be sued. They're in the wrong here. You have every right to sue them. Now think about this. They've been doing this. They've been cutting off the campaigns of progressives access to Van to suppress their campaigns. This is the Democratic Party, but yet it sounds more like the undemocratic party to me than anything. So Bernie Sanders, uh, please do not settle stick with this, follow through with it, sue them, regardless of the consequences of the election, because this is unethical. And one of two parties that are actually electorally viable in this country should not be resorting to these tactics. So we have to sue them to teach them a lesson. Don't you dare settle, Bernie Sanders, please. Don't be the nice guy, because thus far, it's, it hasn't gotten you very far with the DNC. They've done everything to tip the scale in favor of Hillary Clinton's campaign. And we cannot let up here. We have to punish them. We have to set a precedent that they can't keep resorting to these destructive tactics to your campaign and other progressive campaigns. Nico House, the president of the North Carolina College Students for Bernie Sanders group at UNC, has evidence that Hillary Clinton staffers and supporters have infiltrated Bernie Sanders campaign in North Carolina and attempted to sabotage his efforts there. So here are the details. According to Nico, several people that are allegedly connected to the Clinton campaign began working for Bernie Sanders, uh, and things got a bit weird. Now, these people were recommended by other people who he says had ties to the Clinton campaign, and they were not vetted at all. Uh, so he claims that they were blatantly trying to sabotage Bernie Sanders' campaign from within. Now, when it comes to one individual, there is someone named Aisha. And before she joined Bernie Sanders' campaign, she had pictures on her Facebook page uh, with her and Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Uh, she had a, a lot of pro-Clinton posts. She talked on Facebook about how she was phone banking for Hillary Clinton. But her actions are what really raised Nico's suspicions. So she ignored requests from organizations like the North Carolina chapter of the NAACP who actually wanted to get in touch with the Sanders campaign. Uh, she ignored requests from really important people like mayors in North Carolina who wanted to endorse the Bernie Sanders campaign. So you can chalk this up to incompetence, but he's not so sure that that's the case. So Aisha was recommended by an individual who is the former chair of the North Carolina Democratic Party. This is a guy named Robert. Now, he's a Hillary supporter. He works for the Bernie Sanders campaign, and he also pu pushed for Aisha to join Bernie Sanders campaign in North Carolina as well. So what they found when they looked in this guy's desk was a little bit unsettling. So they found thousands in unpaid bills for the Sanders campaign. They found uncashed checks that came to the Sanders campaign. And this is bad. <laughs> you don't do this if you work for Bernie Sanders. Now, this guy allegedly had clout within Bernie Sanders' campaign in North Carolina, so this is a bit scary. Now, again, this can be 
chalked up to incompetence. We don't have the full story here. Uh, the details are slowly but surely emerging, and Nico is still investigating this story. He's talked about it a lot. I'll put a link in the description box to his channel. Now, the thing that's frustrating is that these people were not vetted and were hired, and they have not done very well in previous campaigns. So Nico asserts that they would not have been hired if they were vetted because their previous history working on campaigns was devastating. So because of that, I mean, maybe you can chalk it up to incompetence, but at the same time, he claims that they have malicious intent. So here's the thing. Either the Sanders campaign hired a bunch of incompetent people or they actually do have malicious intentions. Now, we need to take a step back and be objective here for a second. So the Clinton campaign might not be connected with this. There are Democratic establishments in every single state who have a vested interest in getting Hillary Clinton into office. So you can't necessarily attach that blame to Hillary Clinton. And even uh, when it comes to the Democratic establishments in each state, you can't necessarily attach blame to them. Because even if these people were trying to sabotage Bernie Sanders' campaign from within, it could be the case that they were just doing it on their own accord if it is the fact that they were trying to do this. But we have to take into account the fact that we haven't heard from these people. They haven't defended themselves as of yet. So we don't have all the details for this yet. So not only do we need more evidence we need someone else to corroborate with Nico's story in order to f for it to have more validity. Now, Nico claims that people from almost every state uh, who work for Bernie Sanders have reached out to him after he spoke out and said that they've witnessed suspicious things just like he did. So that could be the case, but if you are working for Bernie Sanders and you witness suspicious things, you've got to speak out because without the evidence, we can't do anything about it. Without your testimony, we can't do anything about it. Nico alone is not enough to warrant an investigation or to warn us to raise hell about this. But the bottom line is that the reason why we have to talk about this is because we do have some evidence, Nico's testimony, that this is occurring. Uh, so what we need now is more people to come forward and talk about what they've seen and what they've witnessed. So the point of me sharing this is not to get you to freak out and raise hell, but I want people to be aware if you work for Bernie Sanders, uh, of this possibility. You have to be cognizant of people coming into the campaign that weren't vetted with malicious intentions. It may be the case that these people were just incompetent because we all know there are many incompetent people. All of us have worked with someone who's incompetent at some point in our lives, but at the same time with how entrenched uh, the Democratic establishment is in all of these states and nationally, we are right to sometimes put on our tinfoil hats, but at the same time, we have to be aware that uh, we've got to be objective. We have to have more evidence. So if you've seen this, you've got to come forward. But if you're working for Bernie Sanders, just be wary of this possibility. We have had uh, Steve report this. We had Nico report this in um, North, North Carolina. Carolina. And didn't you speak with people in other states I've, that were talking about the, these similar issues happening? I have spoken to people in Minnesota. I have spoken to people in Illinois. I've spoken to people in Tennessee who've experienced the same thing. And I have also spoken to people in some other states who do not want to reveal that right now because they want to continue along the primary path. Hillary Clinton has a really difficult time raising campaign funds from her supporters. So what she has to do in return is pander to oligarchs and big businesses in order to get money to run. So Politico explains that she's at it again. For two seats at the head table with Clinton, George Clooney and his wife, attorney Amal Clooney at an April 15th fundraiser, a couple must contribute or raise a whopping $350,000 a huge ticket price for a hard dollar fundraiser. Now, this is the third event where the Hillary Victory Fund was doing a fundraiser with celebrities. So a fundraiser at Radio City Music Hall earlier this month featuring Katy Perry and Elton John raised big dollars for the Victory Fund. And last December, Sting hosted an event for the Clintons where ticket prices ranged from 33,000 for one person to 100,000 for a couple at the event chair level. The event raised eight million in one night. So the question is, Mike, who cares? Why are you talking about this? This isn't substantive. Politicians do these fundraisers all the time, right? Well, look, this is important. It is substantive because you can learn a lot from the candidate if you look at his or her campaign contributors and how he or she 
raises money. So for anyone who actually pays to meet with Hillary Clinton, you're doing it wrong. Uh, politicians are supposed to want to meet with you because they're claiming that they want to represent you. So why are you paying them? And furthermore, to pay to meet one of these celebrities who support Hillary Clinton? Come on, man, don't do it. They're just celebrities, just like you and me. They pee, they shit, and just because they're rich and presumably love the smell of their own farts, it doesn't make them better than you or me. We're all equal, we're all human beings. Please, stop propping people up on a pedestal, okay? Anyone who would pay this much money, well, you'd have to be rich, but you're also kind of stupid. I mean, I understand that this is going to her campaign if you support her, but $350,000? Because you get to uh, sit with George Clooney? Ooh, George Clooney, whoop de doo Come on. I could think of a lot of other people who I'd want to sit with than George Clooney or Hillary Clinton. And I can tell you this, I certainly would not pay $350,000 to meet with anyone, ever. See, the problem is that this dinner, this fundraiser, is a microcosm of the broader issue that Hillary Clinton has with campaign contributions. She expects us to believe that she's fighting for us in spite of the fact that she's taking money from the fossil fuel industry and pro-fracking companies, or from the private prison industry, or from defense contractors, or from foreign governments who violate human rights. And you expect us to believe that you care about your naive supporters who would donate $5 thinking that they're helping and that you care about them? It's shameful. It's so shameful. Look, if you... <laughs> If you want to spend money on a political campaign, it's better spent helping out down-ticket Democrats. It's okay if you like centrist candidates or if you like the establishment, but send that money to a down-ticket Democrat, not Hillary Clinton. She has money from the billionaires and the millionaires and big business and all these idiotic celebrities who probably couldn't name a single policy position that they think Hillary Clinton is better than Bernie Sanders on. So Hillary Clinton is definitely fighting for someone. I'm not saying she's going to get in there and not do anything. She's fighting for someone, all right. But it's not going to be you. It's going to be her rich buddies. So the internet is going crazy over allegations of a potential Ted Cruz sex scandal with five different women. <coughs> so let's go ahead and do some digging and figure out who the source is. So let's turn to Google here. And... Okay, so it looks like the source is... The National Enquirer. Really? This is what all the fuss is about? Now look, at the same time, I would be both surprised and unsurprised at the thought of a Ted Cruz sex scandal. Uh, on one hand, I wouldn't be surprised because all these theocratic, hyper-evangelical people, they always have some type of sexual skeleton in their closet. But on the other hand, I, I really would be surprised because I don't think that one person, let alone five, would want to sleep with Ted Cruz. In fact, the thought actually makes me a little bit nauseous. <coughs> now, let's be 100% fair to the National Enquirer, even though I don't have to be. They broke the story of the John Edwards sex scandal, and they were correct in that case. But even a broken clock is right twice a day. So <laughs> I want to read to you some of the headlines from the National Enquirer, and then I'll let you decide for yourself whether or not we should trust them. Obama's secrets, his close friendship with terrorists, and screaming matches with his wife over other women. All right, uh, another one here. Michelle's 15 million tell all. The first lady's ruthless revenge revealed Obama's cheating, boozing, and drug use. <laughs> now another one. Iron Man and Hawkeye's secret affair. I don't know if they got the memo, but Iron Man and Hawkeye don't exist. These are fictional characters, guys. So, uh, another one. Hillary Clinton, six months to live. Obama marriage explodes. Hillary caught in sex scandal cover-up. Do you see the trend here? Everyone's dying. Everyone's involved in a sex scandal. Everyone's doing drugs. The National Enquirer is not a credible news, news resource. They're a tabloid. This is pollution. These are bottom feeders who sensationalize any and everything in order to make a couple of bucks for the poor, naive person at the grocery store who sees that headline and it grabs them and they think, all right, I want to learn more, so I'll buy it. That's how they make their money. This is the same magazine that claimed that they found Bigfoot or spotted Bigfoot or whatever. Come on. So unless we have an actual credible source come out and confirm this, unless we have evidence emerge, then we can't accept this as 
fact. It's fiction right now. And furthermore, uh, this was leaked to the press by a Rubio ally, according to some outlets. But if this was a legitimate story, why would they leak it to the National Enquirer? They have no legitimacy. Wouldn't you rather leak it to a actual credible source? Maybe the Guardian? Maybe the Nation? Hell, even the Daily Beast. Why would you leak it to the National Enquirer? It's because they'll accept everything. And because they're not a real news outlet. They're just, it's bullshit. It's, it's tabloids. They do it to make money. So please, please, please do not trust anything that you hear from the National Enquirer. I shouldn't have to come out and defend Ted Cruz, but I'm going to have to do it because we have to be objective just because we want this to be true or more specifically Donald Trump supporters really, really, really hope that this is true. Uh, you got to wait until you see evidence. Now, just like any claim, sure, maybe this is true. Maybe it's false. But given the history of the National Enquirer, we have to automatically dismiss it unless another source more credible confirms it. So for now, this is fiction. So lately, I've been trying to tell you guys about Bernie Kratz. These are down-ticket progressives just like Bernie Sanders who are anti-establishment and are running to try to change the party. So I told you about Tim Canova and others. I haven't gotten to all of them, but I've got a new one for you guys that's pretty exciting. So Alex Law is a progressive Democrat running for Congress, and he's been on the campaign trail for 18 months. Now, even before Bernie Sanders made it a thing, Alex decided only to raise funds from small donors. He doesn't have a super PAC and isn't taking money from any corporations. Now, his campaign has knocked on more than 50,000 doors, and he's knocked on over 10,000 doors himself. So he's given his establishment opponent a run for his money. Now, if elected, Alex Law would be a game changer for the Democratic Party, and his campaign campaign is very important for our political revolution. So I was excited to have the opportunity to actually speak with Alex about his campaign. So Alex, if you can go ahead and tell my viewers a little bit about yourself and why you decided to run for Congress at such a young age. Well, thank you for having me on the Humanist Report. Huge fan of the program. Thanks, man. Uh, and, and this this campaign, it really started um, in a very small, humble way where some friends and I were sitting watching the news. At the time, Congress was at a total standstill, um, and we didn't like what we saw. Uh, and we looked locally at the corruption and the graft and the cronyism, which I'm sure we'll get into here in South Jersey, and we didn't like that either. So we said, you know what? Rather than complaining uh, about what was happening uh, in our government, we said, why don't we do something about it? So we put together some policy. We made a quick website, not as nice as the one we have now, which is alexlawforcongress.com. Uh, and we print up some flyers, not as nice as the ones we have now. And we just went out and started knocking on doors. And from that very small start, uh, we now have knocked on over 50,000 doors, made over 50,000 phone calls, have 120 volunteers, a wonderful campaign headquarters, and really think we're going to be in a, an excellent position to accomplish something historic here on June 7th. Now, to kind of follow up there, so when you guys say you've knocked on thousands of doors, this isn't just, you know, a group of volunteers and you're just kind of sitting behind the scenes. You've knocked on almost 10,000 doors yourself. Is that correct? That is correct. So uh, I've knocked on now uh, this week. I crossed the 10,000 door threshold. I also crossed the 1,000 miles of door knocking threshold uh, in the last eight months. So I'm personally out there on the front lines with my team knocking on doors. Uh, just today, I, I spent about two hours knocking on doors in a small town called Haddon Heights, talked to a bunch of wonderful people. And the amazing thing is, um, in, in this district, in this election, uh, my opponent is tremendously unpopular. And about 95% of the people that I talk with are extremely excited uh, about our campaign, the fact that they have a real Democratic alternative to this Democrat that had been representing them. Uh, that has voted with Republicans more than any Democrat in the state of New Jersey that's taken over $10,000 from Donald Trump to fund his campaign. They're excited about us. So our challenge isn't convincing people. Our challenge is making sure that we reach enough people. And we're going to work as hard as we can to do that. Now, I want to ask you the easiest question that you're going to get so far. Okay. So, <laughs> um, and I'm going to give you more time for this one because you're going to have a lot to say, I'm assuming. So when it comes to your opponent, Donald Norcross, can you just explain why you're better than him? So uh, Mr. Norcross... Um, he, he's part of a, a family, uh, the Norcross family, uh, that has created a political machine here in South Jersey. Really the epitome of everything that Bernie Sanders is running against. People that exist because of big money in politics, because of pay to play, because of cronyism and graft and corruption. Um, and, and he has been basically appointed to every office that he's had. 
Uh, Mr. Norcross, since he's been in Congress, has voted with Republicans, like I mentioned, more than any Democrat in the state of New Jersey, almost combined, um, with huge votes with Republicans on things like the Keystone Pipeline, like expanding uh, defense contracts for his campaign donors like Lockheed Martin, um, going against the president on the Iran deal, going against the president on the refugee bill, which I think really speaks to who we are as a nation. So um, he's been tremendously disappointing. And, and what I would say, too, is his machine, this, this political organization, uh, right here in South Jersey, the first district, it's the only place in the United States of America, the only place that since I've been alive, has not had a single bill that's become a law written by a representative of the first district. It's the only place. Um, and although Mr. Norcross has only been then there for one term, hopefully his last term, uh, the previous congressman, Rob Andrews, was part of that machine. He was uh, actually uh, asked to leave Congress because of corruption allegations. So uh, this is something that we're very familiar with here in South Jersey, something that I think South Jersey has been waiting for someone to fight back against it in a meaningful way, and that's what this campaign is doing. One thing that has been a consistent trend with the new generation of progressive Democrats like yourself and Tim Canova and Bernie Sanders is that the DNC is doing everything they can to shut down your guys' campaigns. So as all my viewers know, I reported on this, Tim Canova's access to Van was cut off. And also this same thing happened to you last year as well. And also uh, there's some issues with the ballot in your state. So I just want to ask, do you think that the Democratic establishment in New Jersey is trying to suppress your campaign? Uh, and if so, how has this been the case? Well, 100 percent. Look, the, the establishment is not uh, does not like when a young person with good ideas, passionate, positive politics comes on the scene and says, you know what, I'm not going to. Uh, play the, the political machine game. I'm going to get in there and actually try to help people, put people first. Because a fundamental idea in our campaign is something that Teddy Roosevelt said a long time ago. He said, when we rule ourselves, we have the responsibility of sovereigns, not of subjects. And, and we really firmly believe that, that we, all of us coming together, are, are really saying enough is enough. And that's what Bernie Sanders' campaign, I think, has fundamentally been about. Now, here in New Jersey, how have they been trying to uh, make it difficult for us. Well, yes, as, as a lot of people have been outraged about what's going on with Tim in Florida, and I've spoken with Tim's campaign, and we've been helping him with some of the solutions that we've come up with, in that this happened to us over a year ago. We were the first person to endorse Bernie Sanders that was running for federal office. Um, we were on the scene first, and New Jersey's uh, uh, Democratic Committee denied us access to the van. And our wonderful supporters, people like are in your audience, called them hundreds of times, probably thousands of times, forced them to give us an answer because at first they were just ignoring us, refusing to either deny or not or, or give it to us. Um, and, and because of this enormous um, commotion that we created online and with phone calls, the CEO of Nation Builder, the CEO of another company called L2 reached out um, and they set us up with L2, which is a wonderful data company uh, that actually offers the same thing as Van, uh, except a little better in my opinion. So we've been using that for our data solutions, which has been great. Now, you mentioned the ballot uh, issue. Now, this is a huge thing. And this is something, by the way, um, that I know a lot of your viewers are fans of Bernie Sanders. The work that we've been doing around this ballot issue, which I'm about to describe, has alerted Bernie Sanders to a huge vulnerability that he has here in New Jersey. Um, and because of the work that we're doing, because of the money we put into the lawsuit that is currently active against the clerks, uh, here in New Jersey. His campaign has been made aware of some secret rules um, that would have put him in a very unfavorable ballot position. So let me explain it as quickly as I can because it's about as unsexy of a topic as there is, but it's actually fundamental uh, to our democracy. So um, you have your ballot in New Jersey, unlike a lot of other places. You have the people, uh, the, the office um, in rows, and then the people's names out in the columns. So what happens is, uh, they were doing, uh, I found out that the machine, the establishment, had won the random drawing for column one, the most important right. column, every year since we could find records for it. So I said, how is that mathematically possible? Yes, yeah, not every year did they have a challenger, but many years they did. How could they win every single time? So um, uh, after, and, and all of this is outlined in detail on alexlawforcongress.com. Now, um, eventually, we basically found out that they have three separate drawings for three separate classes of candidates. Now, none of these rules are public. Um, they don't let anyone know how this procedure works, what forms, anything, nothing. All of it is secret. 
Um, and, and to me, it really feels like, you know, the book Animal Farm. All animals are equal, except for pigs are more equal. And it, it revolves around something that we have here in New Jersey called freeholders, which are the county officers and people that are bracketed with freeholder candidates go into drawing number one, and then other freeholder candidates go into drawing number two, and then everyone else goes out into drawing number three, including Bernie, um, if he doesn't get freeholder candidates, which we're working with now to make sure he has freeholder candidates in every county in New Jersey, um, uh, to compel these clerks to put us into column one. So they have been obstructionists every which way, from local Democrats clubs making up and hiding uh, their, their rules to the clerk with the ballot, to the van, uh, but we're persevering. Uh, quite honestly, we are, we've been ahead of the Norcross campaign every step of the way here in New Jersey. Um, and we, we think we're ahead right now coming into June 7th. For all of my viewers who don't really know the importance of ballots, see your positioning on a ballot sometimes can make or break your campaign. Individuals will vote based on ballot positioning. So if you're just all the time by it, ballot, it's just terrible. So this is fundamental. It's, it's make or break. So this is why this is so important for Alex and Bernie Sanders. Um, so getting on the topic of Bernie Sanders, so seeing that most of my viewers are familiar with Bernie Sanders, I figured it would be a good idea to kind of discuss your policy positions, just a general overview and how they relate to Bernie Sanders or maybe how they're different. Can you just kind of give us the rundown? Cause you're a true progressive. Yeah, no, no. I, and I appreciate that. Um, like I said, we, we endorsed Bernie on day one. Uh, we were the first ones in New Jersey to do it. Something I was very excited, very proud to do. And this was well before his rise in the polls and people sort of rallying to his wonderful campaign. Um, I, I, at the beginning, it just came down to a very simple idea that um, he, unlike Hillary Clinton, uh, walks the walk uh, to his talk of campaign finance reform. And I think that that quite possibly could be the biggest issue facing our democracy right now, making sure that our democracy is no longer for sale um, and that we have meaningful uh, policy put in place to address campaign finance reform. So Bernie and I are very similar, almost across the board. People ask me, oh, well, where are you different than Bernie? Hard to say, maybe some finer points. Um, and by the way, we probably have more policy on our website than anyone else running for Congress. You, you absolutely do. <laughs> and we have a tremendous amount of policy. Because most politicians, quite honestly, they don't want to put their policy out there because they don't want to be questioned on it. Uh, they might not understand it themselves. It might have been an intern or a staffer that wrote it. Uh, with my team, I wrote every single piece of uh, the information that's on the website. I live and breathe this stuff. I love politics. I love policy solutions. And we have a ton up there. And I think a lot of it you'll agree with. Um, you know, we talk a lot about the idea of um, student loan reform, how important it is. Because right now our banks are borrowing at less than 1%. Our students are borrowing at upwards of 12%. So we're turning our banks into charities and our students into profit centers. This is not okay. I gave a talk just a week ago and a young man stood up and he said, Alex, I've been paying my student loans for 10 years. I haven't paid a penny of principal yet. And that's just, it's crushing. Um, generations of people are being saddled with debt that they have no bankruptcy protection for. Absolutely horrible. We can reform that. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, the incarceration issue that we have in the United States. You know, we have a, a creed, an American creed that says the land of the free, but the, the American deed does not match the American creed and that we imprison more people than any country in the history of the world. And disproportionately, it's young African-American males. Um, so we can address that by getting rid of the horrific, ridiculous, horrible, every piece of empirical evidence shows it doesn't work, mandatory minimums. Uh, we can uh, legalize things like marijuana, change our idea of how we deal with drugs in our society from punishing, which does not work. It's proven it doesn't work. It, it's almost been proven at this point that it was a Nixon era policy to uh, repress African-American and minority voting. Um, to, to treatment. So if people have a problem with whatever kind of substance, rather than throwing them in jail, they get out in 60 days and go right back to the place where they had problems, we, we deal with it with treatment. Um, so from, from issues like that uh, to sustainable energy, look, Morocco, wonderful country. No reason that Morocco should have the biggest solar uh, plant in the world. The United States should be leading the world in this kind of technology, it becomes a net export for us, it becomes a job creation uh, source. So uh, we talk about a lot of policy. Those are a couple big ones that I talk about often, but happy to answer any questions that you have. Sure, sure. So I think that everything that you said encapsulates why you're important or your campaign, excuse me, is so important, not just for the first district of New Jersey, but for the entire United States. Like, for example, I'm someone who has a tremendous amount of student loan debt. So if you get in Congress, you can produce policies and be part of policies that will help me as well. And this is the same thing for all of my viewers. So this isn't just important for New Jersey. I mean, this is a political revolution. This is nationwide. Uh, and I'll tell you the 
biggest thing that I love about your campaign is that you do not take corporate money. So I kind of want to get into the specifics of campaign finance. So I know you support campaign finance reform, but can you speak to the specifics on that? Do you uh, support public funding of elections? Like uh, what, what is your uh, ideal goal for that? Well, I think first you got to get the untraceable dark money out of politics. Unfortunately, that will probably require a constitutional amendment, which um, at, at soonest would be two years away. But we shouldn't be discouraged because there is major, major things that we can do right now without that constitutional amendment. The first thing being um, comprehensive pay to play uh, legislation. And what I mean by that, when a business uh, has government contracts in an area, they should not be allowed to contribute to the politicians that control those contracts. And we talk about campaign finance reform on the, the macro, big national level, but the reality is our democracy is bought and sold every day on Main Street in the small town that you live in because of pay to play politics. And we can address that right now. Um, we can address it on a national level, federal congressional act. We can address it at a state level. We can address it at a county level. We can even address it on a town level. And some towns across the country have already started to do that. A great organization to check out about policy that is starting to be implemented in small towns across the United States is represent.us. Um, and they've been working with people, getting them educated on how to do this to make sure that your town does not have that kind of pay to play uh, politics in it. Um, so I think that's something that we can do right away to solve those problems. That sounds fantastic. So uh, one thing that I want to talk about is, uh, climate change. So you are someone who I can trust will get into Congress and actually fight for uh, to stop climate change because you're not taking money from the fossil fuel industries. And that's not the case with uh, progressives who like to get things done like Hillary Clinton. So I can trust that you will actually do something about it. Uh, but when you get in there, what can you do to really uh, galvanize support within Congress? How do you plan to take on climate change? Well, so there are a couple questions in there. The first thing I want to tell you guys, and this is something that I think a lot of your viewers will be interested in. We've spent uh, just about zero time talking to rich people about donations. Um, we, our campaign has been entirely 100% funded by small donations, by people being compelled to come to our website, like what they see, giving us money. Our campaign, right, you look at how much congressional campaigns cost, a million dollars, 500,000, 2 million, whatever. We're going to run this campaign for less than $60,000. And we're going to prove that this model of low dollars, high people, high volunteer engagement, high in-person talking to voters can work. And then we're going to teach people all across the country how to do it. So on top of the policy solutions that we'd like to see to get big money out of politics, we're going to show people how to compete without those kind of big dollars. And we're doing it right here against the most uh, well-funded uh, Democrat in the entire state of New Jersey, and we're winning. Um, so uh, we're going to do that, and, and, and it's, it's powered by people like you uh, coming on over and, and giving us 10, 20 bucks, because every one of those donations allows us to go knock on more doors, talk to more voters. Okay, so now let's get to, to climate change and, and, and uh, that entire issue. Look, people, th there are Democrats in Congress like my opponent who take money from Exxon, and then when the vote comes up, they were sure, the Democrats were sure that they were going to vote against the Keystone Pipeline or vote for major um, EPA increases to make sure that there aren't the kind of emissions that are ruining our planet. And then they turn our backs on us because of the campaign contributions. Um, we got to get those people out of there. We need to make sure that people are in Congress that not only understand that this is a moral imperative, which it is, and I think most progressives, if not 100% of them, agree with that, but understand that sustainable energy that smart environmental policy is an economic imperative for the United States. We have an opportunity to lead the world in technology that virtually every country on earth needs. And we're turning our back on that. The way I explain it to people is look, if you have two assets, asset A, asset B, no matter how much money you pour into asset A, it's gonna keep getting more expensive. And then you have asset B. Every dollar you put into asset B gets less expensive for you to buy. Everyone picks asset B. But yet, for some reason, as a nation, we're picking asset A. And the, the reason, of course, is Exxon and, and lobbying and all that kind of stuff. So we got to change that culture. You bring up so many good points. One thing I kind of want to get back to um, is when you talked about how your campaign is being run with about $60,000. This is a brand new model because everybody makes the assumption that if you want to get into politics, if you want to run for office, well, you better uh, cozy up with the corporations and you know the millionaires and the billionaires. Otherwise, you can't get in. That's not the case. You've proven otherwise. Like you have changed the game. 
Well, hopefully, and, and, and you know, right now people are looking to us as sort of the experiment, right? And right, honestly, win or lose, this election is going to be close. This model will work, um, but we need to win this election. We need to get over that final push, this this final sprint, so that we can prove that this model works and take it all across the country, teach young people, teach progressives everywhere how to make sure that you can have a voice in politics even if you don't have rich parents because I don't even if you don't have a network of rich donors because I don't nor do I think you should need that to be a part of this democracy look if you have two feet and a voice and you're willing to work hard and go talk to people you should be able to have a say in our democracy and have a real chance to be in elected office and that's what we're trying to put together with extremely smart uh, data analytics data targeting we are as efficient as possible in the voters that we're targeting and that comes from our L2 data which back to the Tim Canova controversy the controversy I dealt with with the van having data is extremely important but there are other places you can get it besides the the van um, and combining that kind of new age data targeting with old-fashioned retail politics volunteers getting out the vote talking to people at their doorsteps at festivals on the phone combining the two you can do it for very cheap um, you just got to have a good team and a good plan in place. And, and we think we have that. That's absolutely amazing. Okay, so I want to kind of get into foreign policy now. This is a seemingly infinite issue, so we don't have to get too deep into the details. But I think if I ask you a yes or no question, it'll tell us almost everything we need to know about your foreign policy. Okay. So uh, do you think that the United States should be the world's police? That, that, that really is a tough question. I don't know if that's necessarily yes or no. Um, if pushed, I would say no. Uh, but I do think the United States should be part of a coalition of nations that acts to make sure that there is some stabilization in the world. Um, and I think the Obama administration has done a great job with that in certain respects in how it used diplomacy in the Iran nuclear deal um, rather than uh, weapons, rather than drones in order to solve a world problem. Uh, where I think the Obama administration has fallen short is with ramping up our drone strikes program, which just seems like an incredibly, uh, it just seems like a horrible thing. Look, if I was in New Jersey and there was some country flying drones around, I couldn't see it. Occasionally my neighbor's house blew up. With no education, I would hate whatever country did that. It didn't matter what I learned about them, how good they may or may not be, I would hate them. And we're, I think in a lot of ways, um, helping with the radicalization of Islam, the spread of Wahhabism uh, in the Middle East, um, and, and I think we need to change our policy with that. More things like how we behave with the Iran deal, less like how we destabilize Syria or our drone strikes all over the Middle East. Very few people actually know that Obama actually did ramp up the drone strikes when he came into office. And so we kind of endow these democratic leaders with our trust, when in actuality, we don't really know what's going on. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. So getting to another issue that, that I think is really important is institutional racism. So can you talk about some of the specific policies that you would implement to combat police brutality against minority communities? Well, I think, like I, like I mentioned earlier, the legalization of some entry-level drugs is very important because these are the kind of infractions that are being used by law enforcement all across the country to institutionalize young African-American, young Latino males, um, and then they are limited in their opportunities for the rest of their lives. Um, and uh, changing that, I think, overnight will dramatically improve the, the situation that we have uh, with incarceration and institutional racism and law enforcement. I also think, I also think it's important that we uh, implement more of a community policing model. So I think a lot of places are moving more towards a militaristic policing model more intense equipment, uh, more rigorous physical training, more by the, by the letter of the law, arrest, mandatory minimums kind of stuff, um, where I think community policing is actually much more important, where the only time you see a police officer isn't you know when they pull you over, when they arrest you, but in schools and at community festivals and making the police part of the community so that you feel comfortable engaging with and being a part uh, and having police around rather than them just patrolling the streets, pulling people over, arresting people. Um, I think that kind of community model is very important. And right here in South Jersey, I'm, I'm very proud that we have uh, Steve Kelly, who is a police union chief, very progressive person, Bernie supporter, uh, who's running for freeholder on my ticket, who is uh, leading the way with our thoughts and our policies on, um, on uh, law enforcement. Excellent. Okay, so I won't take up too much more of your time because I know you're going to go knock on some more doors right after this because you don't quit. Your campaign's great. That's so right. can you just tell my viewers how we can support you if we 
don't live in your district, if we're not from New Jersey, what can we do outside the state to help you out? Well, okay, so th there's two ways, right? There's always two ways people can help. You can contribute, and I hope that you do consider to do that, whether it's two bucks, 20 bucks, $100, whatever you have, I promise you we will put it to good use um, here. Our campaign is efficient, and every dollar you give us goes straight into our grassroots efforts. So you can do that at alexlawforcongress.com. Um, you can always find us on Twitter at AlexLawNJ, Facebook, AlexLawNJ, um, and interact with and share our stuff on there, which always helps us reach more and more people. Um, but if you're short on money, I know everyone in the Bernie revolution is giving to Bernie, is giving to other progressive politicians, and I understand it. If that money's already been spoken for, I do hope you'll still contribute to us, but if it's already spoken for, that's okay. We've created something uh, called callsforalex.com. And you can get to that through our normal website, alexlawforcongress.com, or just go straight to callsforalex.com. And anyone, anywhere in the country can sign up there um, and make phone calls for us to Democrats here in the first district. And I want to tell you how important that will be. This election in our district, there is 174,000 Democrats. In the last election, Mr. Norcross, for all his power and money and influence, he got 18,000 votes. In this election, because of how close it's going to be, how competitive it's going to be, even in a presidential year, the winner will likely get between 15 and 17,000 votes. So you, wherever you are, Kentucky, Iowa, California, Texas, anywhere in the country, you can make a difference by making phone calls for us. If you call 10 people a week between now and June 7th, the work that you do could very well change this election and make sure that we get another progressive in Congress. So you can do that at callsforalex.com. And finally, if you are in New Jersey or in Philadelphia or in Delaware, we lead groups of new volunteers out to knock on doors every Saturday. So you can go to our website, send us a message. We'll get you set up with that. If you want training for how to knock on doors, to do it for Bernie where you are, or you just want to come and help with us or whatever it is, we train new volunteers on how to knock on doors the correct way with good data, with good um, uh, literature, good, um, uh, good training. Uh, we do that every Saturday. We take out a group of people. So you can go to our website and shoot us a message and let us know you want to be a part of that. So however you can help, please do it. This election is very important, um, and we're going to work as hard as we possibly can to make sure that we have another progressive in Congress. All right. So you guys heard it right there from the man himself, future congressman, Alex Law. Go and donate. If you're in District 1 of New Jersey, it's not even a question. Get out there and vote. Get out there and vote. That's right. Get out there and vote. Stay however long it takes. Uh, bring, bring a lunch because we got to get this done. This is the progressive revolution. It starts in your hometown. So, Alex, thank you so much for being on the program, man. Uh, thank you for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. So if you like what you heard, then please sign up to Phone Bank for Alex. If you have anything to donate, please do that. Any little penny helps because he's, he's going up against a powerful political machine and whatever you can do to help out Alex will be much appreciated. So we've got to help other Bernie Kratz and he's certainly one that's very important. Well, that's the episode. I want to thank everyone for tuning in, and I want to welcome all of my newest subscribers to the channel. I am currently in the process of cataloging all of our older episodes, as well as new ones, on iTunes, and it is a big pain in the ass, but many of you requested it, so I am doing that. It's going to take a while, so please be patient during this process, but within time, you will be able to get uh, full episodes uh, as they come out on iTunes, right to your phone and whatnot. So um, stay tuned, be patient. Uh, so thank you all for your support as always, and I will see you next week.